Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. A Jawaiian song, and not only do you need to sing it, you need to write one. I said, uh, I don't even listen to Jawaiian music, hallelujah, praise God. So, like Dr. Panyan told us about this ministry, it, it helps us to stretch. God just helps us to stretch. And so, I told my West Side Word of Life Kapolei family that we had a Jawaiian song for you folks, and I meant what I said. So you can get up with us and do some skanking. I'm gonna try to with you. All right. Yeah, I can't, I'm cool, 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 I
I need your anointing, come in your power. I love you, Holy Spirit, your captivating my soul. And every day I grow to love you more. Come, Holy Spirit, call on me now. Come in your power. I love you, Holy, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're captivating my, my soul. soul. And every, every day, day, I grow to I love grow you more. To love you more. I'm reaching for your heart. You hold my life in your hands, drawing me. Spirit and in truth, sing, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, call on me now. I need your anointing. I need your anointing. Come in your power. I love you, Holy I love Spirit. You, Holy Spirit, my God. You're captivating my. Father, we do come before you and thank you for all of those that are listening by live stream as well. Lord, what an awesome privilege it always is to lift up the name of Jesus and to know that it's that name, Lord, that brings freedom and joy. We thank you so much that in this place, there's only one name that's being exalted, one name that's being praised, Heavenly Father, and that is the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you for your presence, for your word says we're two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of us. And we thank you, Father God, for blessing, opening up our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. High five your neighbors, say you're looking amazing. I like what you're doing. Keep on, keeping on. Looks good, looks good. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about seven strong. Can you say seven strong? And seven strong refers to the seven pillars that we're working on together as a church to find out what it really takes 
to biblically be, you know, strong in the Lord? What are those fundamental basic principles that the Bible reveals that every person uh, needs to have established in their heart? So there are seven that I'm referring to. I'm calling this message Seven Strong. It's the seven pillars. The Bible says that, uh, Matt, Proverbs 9, 1, it says that um, wisdom builds her house, and she has set its uh, seven pillars. And so I'm just using that as a springboard, but I'm also sharing with you that from the book of uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 21, the Bible says a strong man will guard his house you know, and his, and his goods will be in peace. Amen? And so, uh, so it's important. The house that I'm talking about, of course, would be inclusive of your home, but it begins with you. Say, it begins with me. And the Bible talks about how we need to take heed to ourselves. Because how many of you know that if you're in any kind of relationship, not just with the opposite uh, um, sex, but I mean, I'm just talking about just in relationships, you have to learn to be strong in yourself. You have to find your core strength because your strength adds value to that other person as you would want them to add value to you, right? So it's important that whether you're a father or mother or single person, whoever you may be right now, that you understand that there are some core strengths that you and I need to understand that are biblical. And in this particular case, what I find is these seven things I'm going to bring to your attention are seven areas that that are somehow being uh, diluted in the body of Christ, not being spoken about, even though I'm sure when I do mention them, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that, and I know that, and I know that. I don't think that you don't know these. What we want to do is get the revelation and insight and application of them in every day of our lives. So these seven strong are seven things you can use every day, should be using every day in your life to grow stronger and stronger. And so the first pillar was we called it the supply, which was talking about more about prayer. And how God offers a supply to you. We talked a little bit about that. Last week we were together in the morning. We talked about, um, we talked about the name. Let's say the name. The name of Jesus is the second pillar. I want to continue that simply because I didn't have Sunday night. We had Pastor Sergio here with us. He did a phenomenal job. He, I mean, he just blew it up. And, uh, and then Wednesday night when we would have continued again, um, he was here on Wednesday night, and he did, again, another terrific job. And so, um, so I want to go back and cover some things from a different angle. I would say the name of Jesus. Turn your neighbor and say, we're talking about the name of Jesus. You know, I, I think it's important that you and I understand that one of the, uh, uh, in the book of Acts, the book of Acts kind of is the first 33 years uh, of Christianity after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And... Um, and the, 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 key, the key principle that you see happening all the time are miracles, signs, and wonders. I mean, just incredible as the gospel was beginning to grow, even under much persecution and much resistance. But the name of Jesus was what uh, not only every believer was using, but what those, what we call, quote-unquote, non-believers were recognizing was the power. And... Um, and of course, later on, Paul the Apostle, who's revealed in, the, of course, the book of Acts, as well as the other apostles, Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 2.9, we kind of used this last week, it goes up on the screens right now, and it says, everyone read it out loud, ready? Read. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. It's important that you and I recognize these first two verses here. Um, because here, uh, Paul is revealing to us by the Holy Spirit that the name of Jesus is not just a religious idea, uh, a religious phrase, uh, a little statement that we kind of use with a small community of people. But it is the name above all names. Not only that, it reveals here in this verse that it has an effect in three realms. Of things in heaven, referring to the angels. Uh, things on earth, our circumstances. And things under the earth, referring to dark forces or demonic forces. And it's the name above every name. If anything is named, Jesus' name is above it. Jesus' name has authority over it. We'll talk more about that as we go along. In the book of Acts, we read last week also from Acts chapter 4, 
verse 12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name. Who we'll say no other name? No. Say it again. No other name no. under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, it's important that you and I understand that this word salvation is not just like coming to the Lord and, and although that is the most important, it is salvation in every dimension of life. Your healing, your emotional state, your physical state, you know, your spiritual, um, your financial, it's peace, it's uh, prosperity in every area, it's, it's strength for your family, strength in all areas of your life. It's salvation is all encompassing and excludes nothing. But it's the name of Jesus that's key. This is what the New Testament reveals. Now, as I said a moment ago, one of the one of the keys um, that unlocks the new the New Testament, especially beginning with the book of Acts, is the use and the power, the dominion that believers had in using the name of Jesus. And sometimes it can become a religious statement. And we forget, we get familiar that it is the key that gives us authority over the negativities of our life. See, no person has to live depressed or oppressed or sad or mad, uh, you know, or um, in bitterness or offended or an unforgiveness or, you know, down, uh, disgusted uh, on all areas of life. Because the name of Jesus sets you free from every opposition that would come against you. And uh, this is truism. The Bible is the manual by which and how we learn to live life. Without the Bible, you don't know how to live life. You know some things about life, but not as much as the life giver who gave you life. Because you and I... This might not be used to somebody, but it might be used to one person. You know, you're not wiser than the creator. The creation is never wiser than the creator. And the Bible gives you insight on how to walk on this earth. See, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Which means, yes, yes, we understand natural laws, physical laws that govern this earth as God created it. But we're not to be dominated by the evil in this world. Evil does not have to dominate you. You don't have to live by fear. You don't have to live sad. You don't have to live depressed. You don't have to live, you know, poor, broke, and, you know, upset about everything in life. Hmm? So since you're feeling all of that, we're going to move right along. And so it's important that you and I understand that the early Christians really regarded and used the name that is above all names the name of Jesus. And I want to help somebody in this room. That name is greater and has more authority and power than whatever you might be contending with. And sometimes we forget that God has given us the authority. When I say authority, the right to use that name. Christianity is not a, a sucker punch for those who want to carry crutches in their life. You know, we just kind of hide out in the four walls of the church. Christians aren't living in fear. Nor are they supposed to live dominated by the circumstances and the voices of this world. Anytime the spirit of intimidation tries to come upon you, you need to fight back because that is not the spirit of God. And God has given you authority to resist the adversary no matter how he comes at you. You don't have to live insecure. You don't have to live messed up emotionally. And you don't have to live according to something that happened to you in the past. And the thing is, if we don't learn to understand the name of Jesus Christ, we will be dominated by life's circumstances. And that is not what Christ came to do. He came to set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? So the book of Acts demonstrates that believers continued to, to walk in the miraculous even after Jesus ascended and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Because as we spoke about last week, he gave us what's called the power of attorney. Now, the church needs to understand that there is authority in the name of Jesus. 
It's in his name, by his name, and through his name that you and I have victory. Not just church members, but we live in victory. And um, a believer must know the reality of the authority. Now, I understand this might be new to some of you, but this is why you're here. If it's new, it's because this is not a pillar for you. If it's new, it's because you don't, you may have heard about the name. Well, you hear the name being used all the time by people who disrespect it, dishonor it, misuse it, abuse it, as well as in the church. Don't confuse the two. One has really, anyone can, well, anyone can speak it, but only you have authority to use it to its fullest of dominion that it gives you. And that's the difference, and I'll show you what I mean by that. You know, um, in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it reads here on the screens, and you might want to read along with me since you came with your reading eyes this morning. Ready? Read. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Thank you. <laughs> Tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, of course, you just saw in that verse, verse 19, it says, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Well, that, there's two words for the word power. The first power is the word exousia. Not that you need to understand, you know, the literal meaning, but it means ability. Uh, sorry, it means authority. The second word, power, the power that you and I have over the uh, enemy is called dunamis. Dunamis simply means ability. So what God is, what Jesus, and these are the words of Jesus, he's saying, behold, I give unto you power, which means exousia or authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power, which is dunamis, or the ability of the enemy. You have authority over the ability of the enemy. Now, you have to understand that the enemy does have an ability. He uses things that are so common that you wouldn't see it as necessarily demonic or evil or dark, but it is because it takes lives. Jesus said, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life and life more abundantly, right? And so cancer steals. Diabetes steals. Come on, somebody. You know, other diseases steal. And they destroy. Jesus sent his word to heal us. He wants you healed and whole and delivered and free from even what the doctors say or giving you a prognosis or, um, or uh, giving you... Um, their best of insight as they can understand it. But sometimes it can be limited. But there is a name that is above every name by which every knee shall bow, meaning if it's cancer or disease or oppression or fear, you know, or insecurity or whatever it is. It could be poverty. It could be a lot of things. I mean, you don't have to live by the spirit of failure and defeat in your life. You say, well, I've never heard this. Well, you better start hearing it's all over the Bible. And the thing is, most people don't learn about who they are and what God's given them in their life. You know, they're, they're given information, but the information doesn't bring transformation. And the, what we, when you, you and I need to understand is that prayer, pillar number one, offers you a supply from heaven. And the name of Jesus gives you the right to walk, to walk with dominion on this earth. No joke. To your neighbor say, no joke. That's right. <laughs> Anyways, and I want you to understand this. Now, what you might not understand is that you have commanding power. Like, what? You know, you have commanding power. <laughs> Say commanding power. <laughs> let, me, let me show you what it means. Uh, and let, let's go to another verse, and then uh, I will help you to understand this. Uh, in a practical, very practical way. Um, let's go to John 14, verse 12 to 14, and it reads like this. Ready? Read out loud. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
that he that believeth on me and the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye can ask anything in my name, I will do it. Notice what he's saying. At the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, that that name releases power on your behalf to get things done. And you need to understand what he's saying here. There are two ways that you and I can use the name of Jesus. Many ways in where we can use it. Two ways you primarily use it. Number one, to pray. I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's found in John 16. We talked about that last week. But this verse is not talking about prayer. It's talking about the commanding power that you and I have in the name of Jesus to do the works of Jesus. It's quite different. You're not asking depression if it would like to go. You're not asking the cancer cells if they would like to disappear. You ain't hearing what I'm saying. You're not asking fear. If you don't mind, would you please step out of the room? You're not asking insecurity. Would you mind just stop dominating my life for about a week? See, what's important that you and I understand, Greek scholars have defined the word ask as to demand, which means that you have demand, you are demanding something. You are demanding something because it's your right to have it. Now, for some of you, you're like, what are you talking about? Okay, your rights do not come because of your looks. And your rights that I'm talking about do not come because of your nationality, and your culture, and your circumstance. Your rights come through the name of Jesus because of what he did for you and I and all humanity. And that fact that he became our substitute, he died on the cross, he rose on the third day, and when he rose on the third day, he said to the church, he said, all authority has been given unto me, therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations. And those who believe in me, in my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall lay hands on them. In my name, they shall see signs and wonders. And the Bible says, and, and, and they went out and they preached, and, and signs began to happen, you know, in great power and great demonstration. And so I want you to understand that his name releases power. And you're not telling God what to do. Please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You're, you know, you're saying to the spirit or whatever it is or whatever that's trying to come against you. In the name of Jesus, I have a right. My Savior has set me free. My Savior gave me peace, not confusion. I bind the spirit of confusion, and I take authority over it. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6, see, this is where we got to go. Because if you ain't going to be humble, you're not going to believe what I'm saying. You say, like, what did you just say? What you just heard is what I just said. And, uh, and that is this. The Bible says that God resists the proud. The proud are the people that, well, you know, I just don't believe it that way. Why don't you read your Bible? I'm sure I'm not talking to anybody here. Just thought I'd say that. But, you know, religious people always think they have it cornered, right? They think they have the market and everything that they heard. Well, I didn't hear it that way. Well, you just read the Bible and you'll be, you'll be free from whatever someone told you, which was a lie. Because I'm here to tell you that you have a right to be free, but if you don't use your right, you will never get free. Because God is, you know, when somebody said, well, if God wanted to prosper me, then he just prosper me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. And I suppose if, if just God just wanted you healed, he'd just heal you. And I suppose if he wanted you saved, he'd just save you without your decision. See, that whole mentality, way of thinking, really sounds religious and sounds spiritual. And it sounds like you're humble. You're not humble. You're being duped. You're being played upon because he's given you authority. And he said in the book of James, he says that he will give more grace to the humble. What is it to be humble? 
doesn't mean to be weak and feeble and mealy mouse and you don't speak up. To be humble is to submit yourself to his word regardless of how you feel about it. And so that's real humility. But he says to the humble, he will give more grace. Grace is not your power. It's his power working through your life. See, grace is his favor on you, even though you and I don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. He did through the cross of Calvary. But he loved us so much that he empowered you and I. And he says, you have my name to use so that you don't have to live defeated anymore. Come on, somebody. And this is what, listen, man, God wants you to walk with your, with your chest up and your head up and confident. And not cast away your confidence in a world that is just vicious with its labels. And vicious against Christianity. And just absolutely vicious against all righteousness. It's not you. It's the spirit of the world coming against him through you. And you have to realize what you're standing for or you're going to fall for anything and stand no more. But I want you to understand that you and I have been given the name. Above every, and then it goes on to say, James 4, verse 7, it says, Then you will resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know resist, he no flee. I know some of you right now are thinking like, logic, that don't make sense to me. I would never do that. Then you're going to live with whatever you're tolerating. Because whatever you authorize, whatever you tolerate, you authorize to stay in your life. You're going to have to ask yourself a very... Big pregunta. Question. And that is, are you tolerating something in your life that you're authorizing to stay? It could be a, a mentality. It could be a phobia of some sort. It could be a number of various things. See, we sang about the miraculous. We sang about the name of Jesus. This is no game. Jesus wants us all free. You can't, you and I cannot get free without the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. And it's important that you and I understand that you and I have a right to speak to the mountain, whatever mountain it is, in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of self or in the name of some denomination, name of some organization or in a, some kind of bedazzled kind of preacher on television or whatever that is for you. You know, it's about the name of Jesus. That's, that's raw Christianity. That's down to what gives you the strength and the confidence to know that you are a person of destiny. You're a person of identity and you're a person of ability, but not because of you, this flesh or because of your past, or because of your imperfection, but because of his perfection and his love, unconditional love for you and I. Amen? Now, um, let me put some wheels on this, and then we'll, we'll close here. We're circling the airport now. I'm going to use one more passage, and this is where God wants to minister. Could it be up to this point that you've become familiar with the name. Could it be that you may know some things that I'm sharing or even remember some of these statements that used to stir you before, but could it be that you've not been actively engaged with the same kind of excitement for using the very name? Could it be that the adversary has maybe diluted your perspective of your Christianity in some way? I'm going to show you how and why this happens. But I'll show you from an Old Testament passage in Luke, sorry, Numbers 33. And this is going to like really clarify it for you. It says, you can read along with me if you'd like. It says, now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan. A little louder, please. Across from Jericho, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish their high places. 
and you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land that you dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Now, that's Old Testament. Say Old Testament. We don't live in the Old Testament, but we learn much out of the Old Testament. Okay, much. The Holy Spirit used this, and there's much reference from the Old Testament. But this is like you and I here today. Let me put it in context for you. Jesus has given you and I the right to live in Canaan land, what it is called the abundant life. Say the abundant life. It came only and is only through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And the fact that he says, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. That's what he came to give you. Now, sometimes Christians think that because if, if I'm born again, then shouldn't everything be working out? Absolutely, it will when you use your authority, the name of Jesus. Because the enemy is like a gnat. It's like a mosquito, you know, he's bothering you. You're going to have to swap that thing. But you're not using physical strength. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Amen? Okay, so I'm, I don't want to go too fast. But I want you to understand. Now, notice the instructions he gave him. Canaan land was a land of milk and honey. And he says, this is what I need you to do. I, I, I need you to not only cross over. You and I crossed over from being unsaved to being saved. Right? From being unchurched to being church. Right? And um, from having no God to having God live in us, right? And so this is what you need to understand. He says, but when you cross over, make sure you drive out the inhabitants of the land, that you destroy all the engraved stones, that you destroy all the molded images, that you demolish, in other words, that you dispossess the inhabitants that are there. And I want you to realize he's saying, you have to drive them out because the next verse, verse 55, says this. It says, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then, then it shall be that those whom you let remain. First of all, I want you to hear that. If I don't drive them out, if you don't resist, James 4, 6, and 7, if you don't resist the devil, he will not flee. You have to resist. But now you're not just, you're not doing it in your own power. You're not doing it in your strength. You're not doing it in your good looks. You're not doing it on your merits of human strength. It's in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. It's in a power that's not with, that's not about you. It's about him, but he's living in you. And it says, and this is the key that I learned many years ago, that if I do not drive the, out the inhabitants, the inhabitants could be fear. The inhabitants could be insecure. The inhabitant could be poverty. The inhabitant could be the spirit of defeat. The inhabitant could be, you know, all kinds of things that are inhabiting people's lives. Because what I've shared with you muchos times before, and that is whatever you tolerate, you authorize to stay. And what, what this is saying is essentially that. I told you to drive them out. But if you choose not to drive them out, then they will stay. The inhabitants will stay. He says, I don't want them to stay. I've given you authority to drive them out. Oh. And so, see, you don't have to settle for the spirit of divorce. You don't have to listen to the counsel of the world and say, hey, just accept irreconcilable. Every difference is reconcilable if you have humble hearts. Hmm. All right. Well, you're, you're, I, I, you know, shalabatata. <laughs> Whatever that was, right? And it says, and those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land and where you dwell. Uh, I'm going to have to just wrap this up really quick. You know, one of the, uh, I say this often, depending on what setting, one of the um, unfortunate hazards of life is something called hurt. Hurt happens to every person, not because you're a Christian, not because you're a non-Christian. Hurt happens because both Christians and non-Christians have an adversary. It's called the devil. And, um, and life happens, and life comes with hurts. Unless you run off to the Himalayas somewhere and live by yourself, 
You, you'll have to still deal with that loneliness. But I mean, the whole point is, you know, life happens to every person. But what most people, including Christians, have not learned is you don't have to live in your past. You don't have to live as damaged goods. Something, sometimes negative things happen to all of us, whether we initiated it or whether it was imposed upon us. You don't have to live hurt. And many people never resolve issues in their lives. And the name of Jesus is not some trinket. And it's not some little idea, some cute little phraseology that doesn't work in the real world. Are you kidding me? That's the only place it worked in the New Testament church called the book of Acts. Is in the highways and in the byways. And here it says there's three things I want you to consider right now. And I apologize for having to rush through this. It says, if we allow these inhabitants, whatever they may be, whatever the Holy Spirit might be bringing up to you right now, I'm sure he is, because I asked him to. And that is it. Listen, it says, if you don't drive them out, they will, they will, irrit uh, they will be irritants to your eyes. Your eyes refers to what you see. It refers to your vision. It, it refers to what's before you. And they, have you ever had an irritant in your eye? Dust particles. And you, you're like, whoa, whoa. You're like, oh, uh, you know, you're acting all funny, but there's something in your eye. What do you do? You, you try to stop motion. If you're driving a car, you better. Right? You turn on your air conditioning, all the dust that's in the lot just hits you. Because <laughs> you haven't used it for the last six months because you thought you were saving energy. Anyways, then it comes, comes piling out at you, right? And you're, oh. Why? What do you do? You slow down, you pull over. Why? Because you know that your vision has an irritant in it. And if you keep trying to go forward, you're going to end up in a ditch or cause an accident of some sort. And we do that all the time with our marriages and our relationships and, the, and our walk with God and all these things. And even if you're walking physically, you, you stop for a moment. You don't because you're going to lose. You don't want to fall into something. God doesn't want you to fall. So we, what do you try to do? You try to clear out your eye. You try to get rid of the irritants. But in this particular case, that's why many Christians cannot see their future, have fear about tomorrow, are afraid, you know, for what they see, you know, because they have an irritant. The enemy wants to put irritants in your eyes. He wants to blur your vision, your vision for the house of God, your vision for God alone, your vision for your marriage, your vision for you know, your job, your vision for the dream, the destiny that you have. The enemy wants to stumble you. Unfortunately, what we don't do is we don't remove the irritants. And we redefine our life with irritants in our eyes. And so we come up with the excuses. Well, I guess God didn't want me to have it. God didn't want me to have my marriage. God didn't want me to have this. God, no, you didn't get rid of the irritants. In your life. You're settling for a wrong definition because you're not seeing things clearly. I just thought I'd help some of y'all because you were feeling it, but you just weren't moving. Secondly, it's thorns in your side. Remember when Jesus, he was speared when he was on the cross and he speared his side, but it penetrated his heart. And the thorns that the enemy wants to do give you are things that affect your heart. And what I was saying earlier is that, you know, in life stuff happens and we all get hurt. But most Christians don't slow down long enough to get healed from their hurts. Whether it was a relationship that didn't work out, a situation that went sour, you know, a, a number of different things. No one in this room is exempt from hurts, but you don't have to live hurt. Could it be that you may be living hurt? Could it be that you have an irritant in your eye? Could it be that you're hearing this message so that we can get rid of the irritant in your eye or get rid of the hurt in your heart? Whether it's unforgiveness towards mother or father or last boyfriend or girlfriend. 
or whatever's going on. I was hurt by my son, my daughter. I was hurt by my parents. Don't live hurt. You're going to develop a very, very hard and religious heart if you do that. You know, and people are damaged in their hearts because they offended me. <laughs> Come on. The, Jesus said in Luke 17, he says, it's impossible, impossible for you not to be offended. What? No, whoever sold you the bill of goods that said if you become a Christian, you're never going to be touched by the adversary, lied to you. And I don't mean that God is not here to protect you, but God has given you power so you can protect yourself because now you're a target. You're a lethal weapon for the kingdom of, good, for the kingdom of God for good. And the enemy tries to stop us. But in the name of Jesus, he can't. But Jesus said, it's impossible for you not to be offended. But you don't have to live offended. Do you know how many people go in and out of churches offended, living hurt, embittered, in unforgiveness? And it's justified. Well, it happened over here and, you know, it happened on the job. Didn't happen in church or it happened in church. And then you, you, we do things like, you know, I just don't trust Christians. Don't be so naive. You know, because, you know, they offended me and the world doesn't. They hurt me and the world doesn't. So you're saying the devil is greater than God. The silliness that we get into to justify our hurt so that we can hold on to them, rather get healed from them. The name of Jesus heals it heals, but it takes a surrender to be healed. And the third area is this area called harassed in the land which you dwell. Many of us have crossed over, been born again. We still feel harassed. You know what the word harassed means? It means to be annoyed. You ever seen an annoyed person? Everything annoys them. The alarm clock in the morning annoys them. You got to go to work. I'm annoyed. I don't want to go to work. I'm going to go to church again. You're annoyed. You got an issue. You need some tissue. <laughs> Sorry. Really bad. Really bad. I really apologize. Just had to lighten it up a little bit. Y'all getting serious. And it is serious, but I want you to understand. They live bitter and they live hurt. And, um, you know, these little, it's like a gnats and these little mosquitoes. Just, you know, the, 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 the uninvited little things. And everything bothers us. Bothered about everything. You're just bothered about everything. You, you want to go into seclusion. Oh, especially that person. I don't know who it is. Just talking in general. Hallelujah. Kalei say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's what he said. And, and, and so I want you to understand. So I want to close here this morning. Remember, maybe this morning, could it be, could it be that, you're tolerating something. It comes up to you right now. I'm not saying go to a graveyard and dig something up that you've already dealt with. I'm not saying go to a closet and open up a closet, pull out a skeleton from, you know, 10 years ago. All right. I'm talking about something that maybe is going on in the territory of your life right now. Because God wants us free. We crossed over to live in him, by him, and through him, his name, so that we can live free, not harassed. Not blurred, not irritated in our eyes, you know, not hurt in our hearts. Because the collateral damage of living hurt is hurt people, hurt people. And we just keep on hurting people, whether we do it intentionally or unintentionally. The thing is, you have to get healed in your heart. And that just takes a surrender to the name. Of Jesus Christ. Did you receive something this morning? Amen. Let's give him a great big hand. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm sure you've been blessed. I'd like to share with you just some information of how you can contact Word of Life Christian Center. Again, our pastors are Pastor Art and Kuna Sapovera. Our church is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Our mailing address is 550 Queen Street, Honolulu, Hawaii. 96813. If you still use mail, you can go go ahead and mail us, but you can also contact us via email if you have any questions, if you 
have anything you want to share with us, you can email us at wolcc at wolhawaii.com. Again, that's WOLCC, which stands for Word of Life Christian Center, WOLCC at wordoflifehawaii.com. Please email us if you have any questions or if you want to share any testimonies of what God is doing in your life. And we can also have a church in Yokohama. If you're ever in Word of Life Yokohama, our pastor there is Pastor Fukiko Matsuzawa. And her phone number, well, let me give you her email. Um, W-O-L dot Japan at F-L-U 